Time to Talk. Hi, welcome to Time to Talk. I'm Leanne and we're here today to talk about homelessness. Homelessness is not only an issue that affects our community in Campbell River, but communities all across the island. Today we're here with Michelle and Corelli to talk about one of those projects that may alleviate some of those issues around homelessness. Welcome. Uh, thank you for having us today. It's really good to be here. My name is Michelle Staples and I'm the mayor of the city of Duncan. And yeah, I'm just excited to be here and start to share some of our story with you. Excellent. Corelli, tell us a little bit about you. Hi, yeah, my name is Corelli Matice and I'm the coordinator for the Village Project. And uh, I'm really grateful to be here as well and to share, to share with you just the successes and the the beauty of the Village Project as Excellent. well. Tell us a bit about what the Village is. So uh, it might be a better place if it's okay if I start with sort of the history of the Village. Because I think it's important to know where it came from. <clears throat> and so when I was first elected mayor, um, about I guess close to five years ago now, for my first term, the very first thing that I was asked to come to was um, uh, something called street school that was being run at the time. And there was about 60 peers in the room and the peers talked that day about uh, the different things that they needed. And one of the things that they discussed was this need for just a place to get them off of the street. And that it didn't have to be anything, just a place that they could go where there were some basic facilities and where they could set up tents and then you know, gradually build something. Um, they talked about how many people had skills uh, around carpentry and other things and that they could bring to the table. And so that was one of the requests. They had a number of other things that they talked about that day. And so um, I realized that, you know, as in this community and, and other communities across the island and BC and Canada and everywhere else that this is happening, is that um, this is something that we have to do together. And so we invited, um, I invited other mayors and CAOs and, and chairs to come and listen to their story again. Mm -hmm. And then we went out to um, engage with community groups in the region to look at, you know, how many people are really out there? What are their needs? And how do we address that? And working together as a community, um, we had um, the North Couch and was involved, um, the Couch and Tribes was involved. Uh, all different health facilities and, and organizations within um, the region that provide service to people, Island Health, and, and we, we came together and came up with a plan. And part of that plan, it, it, and if you kind of look at it, if there was 100 people who were unhoused, what would the needs of those 100 people be? And so, you know, there was a, a people who assessed and worked directly with people that were um, living unhoused, and also people who were unhoused worked on this together and came up with um, this, this concept that out of that group of people, a certain percentage would do really well just with that idea of what had been suggested, but let's make that more structured, right? So if we were to have little small homes for people and units for people, but then there's other needs that other, peop other groups of people would have and identifying those. And so through a process, we developed a plan for our community and for er to meet the needs of the people that we knew were unhoused at that time. And we presented it to, um, we invited the uh, Minister of um, Mental Health and Addictions at that time to come and hear uh, our presentation about our needs. And we did it on an operational need and we estimated at that time it was about two and a half million dollars a year over five years to actually house and take care of everyone who um, in, in the way that they needed most with the village being a big part of this, which wasn't called the village at that time. So from that, um, we were refused, <laughs> essentially. We were, we were just told no. We, we did invite everyone and, and, and did a presentation and took the minister to the different places in the community and went through that whole process. And they just didn't have the, f the operational funding to do it um, or the mandate at that time. And then s shortly after, the pandemic arrived. Mm -hmm. And the night, the, I remember the first night when everything shut down, I got a phone call from a local business saying, what are you going to do with all these people who are sleeping out on our streets? Um, I'm concerned about the safety of my business. And so uh, I called, uh, at that time, the um, head of our housing society was John Horn, who, um, who w works in Nanaimo now, and said, you know, what can we do? and called BC or called the um, BC Housing and asked them what they were going to do because that was our assumption was that they would be taking care of all of it and they said we need communities to come up with plans 
And so that's when I reached out to John and said, can we work on something and bring this back? Because we already have a plan here. Mm -hmm. And so we called everybody back together and essentially um, within, it was less than two weeks because we already had that plan, we're able to present that to the province. And we all agreed, each municipality, because there's four, four of us in, in our region that border each other, um, Couchin Tribes, the Couchin Valley Regional District, uh, the City of Duncan, and the Municipality of North Couchin, that we would each house a, a site. Um, and Ladysmith as well did at that time. And at that, we were told it was only for two or three months. So we created these sites based on that original plan, which was you only have, you know, if you think of a flower and the services are at the center of the flower, and then you have um, the petals, and the petals are, you know, up to 14 units that are um, fenced from each other, essentially, like I consider them like small gated communities in a sense, right? Mm -hmm. And where people to get to decide, working with service providers, who goes where and how you do that. Um, and so we created these different sites, and but they were only for three months, and they were tents. And so we started to go through that process of, you know, um, we didn't have enough funding to have staff there 24/7. There was, but we had outreach teams, and we called out to uh, a woman named Mary who worked at the Ramada Hotel, and she was the um, she was the catering supervisor. And it's like, she'll know how to organize all these different things and called on people who didn't normally do all of these things. But everybody came together. All of our outreach teams worked together with Island Health and with other areas of, of service provision. And they came together to go and service the people and support the people at the different sites. And then it started snowing and the pandemic wasn't just three months or six weeks. And we realized we need something else because this is going to go on longer than we thought. And so then we had a local builder build us some tiny units. All the funding was through COVID response funding. Those units got put on some of the sites. Um, some people transitioned into other housing and we also opened up the Ramada Hotel at the beginning as well where there was a, a number of people housed there. And, and so we had housed at that, at the peak of it, we'd housed about 117 people. And then as we were going through um, this getting longer and longer and longer, there started to be the question of what are we going to do now? What do we do next? Because we don't, people are starting to be stabilized. So there was a lot of, um, there was a lot of real positive things that we started to notice. And so eventually that e evolved into what is now known as the village. That's a, a site of 34 units with supported housing, more like the flower we talked about. And that's kind of how we ended up here. But it was, uh, from that one idea that was shared that one day led to all of what has happened and brought us here. Wow. So when you came into office, you took a program and feedback from community was homelessness is an issue. Absolutely. And so you came up with a project <coughs> and then it kind of got slid aside because it didn't go through. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And then pandemic came and it changed everything. Mm -hmm. And folks in your community were saying, hey, there's an issue here with homelessness. And it became even more prominent in your community. I think in the apparent. eyes of people. Yeah, because we were in shutdown, so more folks were seeing yeah. what was happening in community. Mm -hmm. And then you pulled out the project. And then you developed the village. And what happened from there? And so we collectively developed the village. So there's no you in any of this. It's yes. definitely something that we all have done together. Yes. Um, and, and so then the village had to go through its own process. So in the meantime, we, we were approved um, prior to this with two supported housing facilities. Okay. One of which now is built and, um, and another one which is in the process of being built. And so during, you know, people stayed in the places that they were in during the pandemic until um, they were transitioned into the uh, what's known as the paddle road site and then there's the the um, people that we were able to actually find a place um, within the city for the um, for the village site now during this time we recognized how valuable this was and how much it was actually helping people um, helping people become stabilized helping people connect with the community helping people i mean there's a huge difference between having a place to go um, a place to u use basic facilities and a place to, you know, so people know where you are rather than being on the street mm -hmm. and being outside. You know, the, it, there's a level of dignity that from even just from moving to the street to that, right, it, it, um, it, it helps people be able to 
you know, find their way th that, that there is something that can happen beyond this, beyond just being um, on the street. And so once we realized that this was actually working and the, the village model was created based on all the things that were learned, because there was a lot of things that didn't go right. <laughs> But there was, you know, and we learned from those and kept creating kind of like 1.0, 2.0, 3.0 .0 um, as we <laughs> move through this. And, and even now on this site, there's things that we would learn for next time because this is on a temporary site. Mm -hmm. And that's part of the struggle that we have is that this is temporary. Um, but people were, were moved to this new sort of upgraded site um, with now 24-7 support. And, and Curly can speak to this much better than I can. Um, and there was a lot of resistance when we, when we went to do this, a lot. I, we had a stack of letters this high, um, and our council and our staff worked, and our community worked so hard to, um, because we'd seen the changes and, and in, in people and, and in our community. Mm -hmm. And so we, um, we moved forward with it, and as really recognize it as a, a, a first stage transition from getting someone, you know, off the street into something that is, um, you know, where they're able to have a home and just the difference that and opportunities that makes, which um, I'll turn to Corelli to, to, to speak to all those. Yeah, I would love to hear more about some of the barriers and how you managed to move through those barriers. But first, I'd like to hear a little bit about you and, and what made you come to this project. Oh, um, well, so I was welcomed into a position of leadership at LACO because of my um, past experience in the Valley and the work that I've done with this specific community. So prior to becoming the coordinator of the village, I had worked as a harm reduction worker at uh, the Couch and Wellness and Recovery Center. And so I developed a real rapport with a lot of people in the area who were struggling with mental health and um, mental health struggles, addiction struggles, and, and homelessness. And uh, actually, I was able to bear witness as a frontline worker the impacts of the projects that came before the village and the positive health outcomes, the stability that many of the people that I served from a different perspective that they had found. There were, prior to, Prior to the pandemic and prior to the Ramada and the other pod sites opening up, uh, there were many people that just struggled day to day and struggled to receive care, struggled to find support. And I noticed, along with many of my other coworkers as well, working frontline the day that the Ramada opened up, the day that those pods opened up, the day that the tents, uh, there was a level of dignity a shift. People who I prior had worried were honestly at imminent risk of dying, found a form of stability, and that stability increased over time. And that was in a tent with the services of like with just basic outreach and even that offered just an incredible amount of stability for people who were prior to that treated often like garbage. And that was the place where I really started to say, housing first, that is, that is the solution. That is the place we start. Because people can't get better. They can't move on without stability. And so, and housing is that, that bedrock of stability. Um, it's, it's a village. Mm -hmm. And it really took a village to be able to not only create the project, but adapt the project, implement it, and continue to support it. And so you've seen uh, from the ground up how different projects have come and gone mm -hmm. and what are some of the most basic needs for folks outside and you see the village mm -hmm. along with a lot of other folks that this is something that has been working for people yes yeah and you've been working in the community with folks before some of these projects have come up mm -hmm. yeah and now you have been with the village for how long so since it opened so it opened in march of 2022 and yeah been with it every step of the way and uh yeah it has been a blessing and an honor to 
help to bring that project, that dream, that vision uh, into its current uh, state. <laughs> And so you have a lot of direct connection with the folks that are there at mm -hmm. the village. And you have connections with them and th what, what is their response to the village? So we have seen dramatic improvements in health, wellness, in their willingness and ability, in people's willingness and ability to reconnect with family, reconnect with healthy social interactions. Uh, in the short time that we've been open, we've seen a, I believe 16% of the village residents have attended treatment and detox programs. And many, many others are in the process of uh, applying for or in, in the process of attending treatment and detox. We have as well a peer program on site, a two-tier sort of peer program. So, uh, and that, not only does that enable vocational training and movement back into the workforce, but it also enables those who, like at the very beginning of these projects, were instrumental in the creation of it to be empowered in speaking to and, and also helping to direct the project's growth as well. Um, yeah, it's been an incredible experience and I know that uh, they've shared as well through, we did a survey at one point and they shared that there was, was 100% reported that they felt that the village was a culturally safe space. And yeah, just dramatic increases in willingness to access health resources as well. That's amazing. This is all great stuff. We're gonna take a quick break and when we come back, we're gonna have Tracy Hamlin come and speak to her experiences living homeless on the streets of Duncan. Once I left the hospital, I had a major addiction to the morphine. I didn't want to be around my children, which ripped right through me. I know what it's like to be freezing cold and trying to sleep. Not because I enjoy that, but because I didn't have a choice. I don't think Michelle realizes how much she changed my life that day. Now we're back. And I'd like to welcome Tracy Hamlin, and she's going to tell us a little bit about her time living outside in the streets of Duncan. Tracy, nice to meet you. I'm happy to be here. Really, thank you for coming. So tell us a little bit in a nutshell about your story, about how you ended up to where you are how today. How I ended up here. I was an overworked mother who decided to have a bath, bubble bath, by herself. Bad move. Um, I had an accident in my bathroom, and fell down and hit my head here and in the back and there's an awful lot of damage back there but um, I lost my memory. I woke up in the hospital, no memory of my children, my husband, my life, me, anything. Um, it was a struggle to relearn everything. I, I remember the first night sitting in the hospital, they put a plate of food in front of me and I'm staring at it going, what the heck do I do with this? Um, life moves on. Um, after I got out of the hospital, by that time, social services had clued in that I was not with my kids. Um, and I ended up losing my children, losing my home because I didn't have a job. Ended up on the street. Um, before that, I was told I wouldn't live past 10 years, maybe. That's pushing it. Um, I would always be in a wheelchair. I'd never be able to work. I'd never, I'd have to have someone look after me. Well, that was 12 years ago. I'm still motoring around, no wheelchair. I have a job and I'm doing what I can to highlight how serious of an issue homelessness is and what it really means because the average person has no clue what being homeless really means. They, so you they don't. lived inside for quite some time and you had a home and a family, yep. so you I had, had a home. Yeah, I yeah. lived in Lake Couch and I lived in Duncan. My children were born at Duncan Hospital. Yep. Um, I had a, what people consider a normal life. I was involved with my kids' schools, blah, 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 and then I had my accident. Yep. And when I woke up in the hospital, I had no memory. And a major addiction to morphine, uh, which was not my choice. I was out cold. So after your accident and losing your children, you lost your home. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I put what I could salvage into storage. Mm -hmm. And after losing your home, 
you coped through morphine? No, because morphine, surprisingly enough, the hospital loves to give it to you, but they don't love to give it to you when you're out at the hospital. Um, I turned to alcohol at first because mm -hmm. that's easily accessible. I had to do something to manage the pain because I had massive, I have what's called cluster, complex cluster migraines. And what that is, is if anybody's ever had a headache, one headache, multiply that by, oh, I don't know, 50, and stick that in one corner of your head. And then I get up to 10 of them. They're little bundles of ouch, big ouch. And that takes an awful strong medication. The morphine works, codeine works, but both, in this sense, I don't like the effect it has on the rest of me. I don't feel like I'm really there. Like I, and, and I mean, it takes care of the pain so I can interact with somebody without ripping their head off, but I don't like the feelings of it. So coming off of it is very hard, but I'm determined. I have not had morphine or codeine in three years. And I don't intend to ever, I mean, I made, made a major stink at the hospital not too long ago that he put it on my chart. I do not want this stuff because even if I get one dose, I'm hooked again. That's, it's something in the body that, I love the feeling of it, but, but no, I don't. <laughs> I've got to keep telling myself I don't like it at all because I don't want to live that life. I want to be healthy. And the next choice was booze because I needed something to dull the pain. Then when that wasn't working, because you build up a tolerance, I turned to street drugs because I was on the street. So how long did you live outside? A little over 10 years. Mm -hmm. And what was that like for you? Completely different. Well, it was hard to, hard to say because when I had my accident, I don't remember my life before that. Not, not even a little tiny bit. I talk like I do because people have told me things that I've done or said or whatever, and I incorporate that into my timeline, but I don't remember it. I don't remember my children being born. I don't remember their first birthdays. I don't remember be getting married. I don't remember my childhood, my mom, my family, none of it. I, do, I just, I don't. I pretend to. I'm a real good actress. I pretend to, but I don't. And so tell me about the Ramada. The Ramada was, I, I actually almost didn't get to the Ramada because I was being stubborn. Um, what is the Ramada, first the, of all? The Ramada is a hotel in Duncan. And when the pandemic hit, there was a whole bunch of us that used to live in and around Warmlands. Well, the police pushed us away, the Warmlands being Warmland Shelter. Um, so we moved into the marsh. The marsh people weren't, uh, I mean, the, the trust people were not that happy that they got tenants without the pay. But anyway, we moved into the marsh. And the staff at Warmland Shelter, which n that's what I thought it was at that time, but it was actually like the group that Michelle was a part of. It was, it's a huge community group. Like there, there's millions. Tons of community partners in this. Even I don't know all of them, but they had set this all up. And I was considered high enough on the level of beha behaviors that I could be part of. Like, I don't know how they figured that all out. But anyway, I got to be in the Ramada. And I didn't believe it at first. I mean, I packed up my stuff, moved out of the, you know, took it down to in my wagon to the Ramada, but I didn't, I didn't really truly believe it. Like I, Michelle was part of the group of people that were welcoming us. Um, there was uh, Judy from, J Judy from uh, the green community there. There was Mary, there was all the staff for the Ramada. All these people that we had never met before because we were homeless, we were, you know, we weren't people. All of a sudden they were treating us like we were people. Mm. We're going, yeah, sure, nope, not happening. <laughs> like, we were so distrustful. We did not believe it. Even when we went through the process and we got into their rooms and they handed us the key, and we were like, yeah, there's a catch here. <laughs> What's the catch? 
Um, and that's when you met Michelle? Yeah, the, while we were waiting to get processed because they, obviously they had never done this kind of thing before, so the paperwork was fairly involved and it took time for each one. They were serving coffee and snackies and stuff like that and Michelle gave me a cup of coffee when I was, like I stood in line along with everybody else and, and I remember when she handed it to me I thought, boy is she ever pretty, <laughs> why nice. is she here? <laughs> Michelle, give us a little bit of take on your story with meeting Tracy. <laughs> so that it was a very chaotic day. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> um, it was a pandemic. You know, we were all in that mode of, and, and we're setting up something as quickly as we possibly can. It's all volunteers, every all hands on deck. If you have time, if you're physically able and you f you know you're healthy, come out and and help. And so. There was a lot going on, and and so when when um, I was handing out um, coffees to people, and and I, I still remember Tracy sitting down with Stacy, and Stacy was talking to her, and Tracy, I I, I remember <laughs> giving give it, pu putting a coffee down, and her just kind of like like sneering at me, and <laughs> just kind of, and I just yeah. started, I was like you know morning hi, and 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 recognizing that yeah this is a very must be a very strange experience for everyone that's coming here. But there's just so much going on that you're not really thinking about anything, right? You're just doing what needs to be done. And that's what everybody came out to do that day. So that's my first interaction that I recall. And so moving forward, you'd heard a story about how that impacted Tracy. How did that come about? So it was a couple of years later, I think. Yeah. Um, it was when the village site first opened. Actually, yeah. it wasn't even opened yet. We were just no, setting no, it up. Yeah. yeah, it was nobody had moved in yet. That's right. The rooms were just finished. In fact, I think Corelli was still putting finishing That's touches right. on things. And uh, the minister yeah. came, yeah. Well, well, Gord somebody or other. MP Gord John came to go. visit. <laughs> and, and so we were at the old site, actually, at one of the, um, the, the called the Mound site that was on Couch and Tribes. And, uh, and so we were there with Gord, and there was a number of people who spoke that day about just the, their experience around the, the temporary pod sites and how that, it imp the, the impact that it had. and. Um, and there was a lot of, you know, there's a lot of tears and emotion because at that point in time, you know, we're operating, we're, we're again, we're just trying to kind of get through to keep the, everything funded, to keep things moving forward. To, we're, it's always, you're kind of always in that advocacy, you know, fighting to keep things moving. Um, to, to have this recognized as, as a really solid form on the housing continuum as like a, you know, if someone's living on the street, here's a, a, this is a, a great next step for so many reasons. And just advocating for that all the time, that you, I d wasn't spending as much time because things had, um, you know, actually going to the sites and visiting and talking to people because you get caught up in that other place. So hearing all those stories, it just kind of grounded me back in all of that. and. And, and everyone that was there too. I mean, there was just, yeah, there was a lot of tears that day. And and and, and, and amazing, you know, heartfelt stories from people about, about how their lives had changed. And, and so, um, so we went to the, to the village site to show um, um, MP John the, the, the village, the new site. And it was my first time being on the site since everything had been there. And there was, again, it was kind of chaotic and, Everybody was, you know, there's this big visit happening, but then there's still all the setup and all these things happening. So similar to how the Ramada was really yeah. that day, but different. It felt a lot different. And so, and then Tracy shared her story and she was standing beside me and, and it was the first time I, I'd ever, first of all, I think, stopped to, 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 to even think about it. And, and the first time I ever heard Tracy's story. And so she was sharing with us that day, like, you know, about on the site that we were on, about the, the, the space that she would sometimes, you know, find shelter in when she was unhoused and, and telling us her story. And again, there was a lot of emotion, a lot of tears. And, and, and I think what I remember is just the hearing the stories that day was that these are, you know, everyone being able to, to speak and, and be together in this way, that wasn't something that would have happened before. And I think that was the first time I kind of really recognized that. Like we're all just sitting together talking and, and, and being open about the struggles and the, and the challenges and the problems and, and, and the stories and, and that hadn't happened. Mm -hmm. And so I was just really just so deeply touched. And then Tracy told this story about that day and how, that, how the impact 
that me giving her coffee, which something I hadn't, you know, I didn't wasn't thinking about any of it at all. And I'll, I'll let her share her 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 her, her story about that. Um, and, but what happened to me when I heard it that day was that was kind of like the the place where I feel like I kind of just like let all the pressure and emotion of all of it just out because it was just so touching to know that something that I just took so for granted and didn't think about, um, but just a gesture makes such a difference and you never know what's going to make a difference. And it was just such a good reminder and, and I just felt so... Simple, genuine kindness. Yeah. I had spent 10 years of being looked over. I wasn't a person. When, when you're homeless and on the street, you're not a person. You're a blob as far as citizens are concerned. That's how you're treated too. Um, you're not treated like a human being. I walked with my head down always and I was never without my ball cap or my hoodie. If you have a ball cap, a hoodie and a backpack, you're instantly an addicted homeless person. I'm not quite sure how that works, but that's the, the feelings you get. After Michelle put the coffee down beside me, she walked away. She was helping other people. She was doing other things. I turned to Stacy, that Stacy Middlemiss, um, and asked her, you know, who was that person? She said, oh, oh, that's Michelle the mayor. I was going to take a drink. And I dropped my coffee. Da who? <laughs> and that's what Stacy's frowning at me, like the mayor. Like, w w what's your problem? I said, but I'm homeless. I'm, I'm a nobody. Why would the mayor serve me? And that sentence, when I asked that question, why would the mayor serve me, a homeless person? It got me thinking, maybe, just maybe, I am a human being. Maybe I am worth something. Maybe I can do something in and this speaking world. Speaking of that, Tracy, I want to tote you a little bit. What kind of committees and what are some of the things that are you are doing that are helping others as well? Well, I first started out being involved in CAT, that's um, the Couch and Community Action Team. That's part of the, I always say it wrong, Couch and Now Network, the health network. Um, it's gone through an awful lot of changes, but it's been around for over five years. That umbrella, so to speak, incorporates the police, city hall, um, the green community, um, grocery stores, um, island health. If it's any kind of com um, society or organization that benefits people, they are part of this in some way, or shape, or form. And what the health network thing does is they know all the people that are, all the organizations that are part of it. Someone comes up with an idea, well, I need, I, I want to do this. This is what I need. How do I go about doing this? Well, the health network pulls together the people that could help and gives the contacts. So they don't actually do it, but they facilitate, you know, they push it together. And that's part of what I was doing. Like I learned how to give um, Knox training time, like, like um, for Knox salon. Me, who is petrified of needles, like I can't stand needles, um, I know how to give the, like to give the Knox stuff. I can give a training, I do that. And it's kind of snowballed. Once I got involved with CAT, I got a little bit more self-confidence in myself. Um, because I was at the Ramada, I was housed, had a roof over my head. I could relax a little bit and turn to me. I didn't have to constantly think, where am I going to sleep? Where am I going to, you know, where am I going to be that I'm not going to wake up to a knife to my throat or a gun to my head? Um, I could start to move forward with my life. And one aspect was that of that. So I still had it in my head that I was never going to walk again. I was never going to work again. I was never going to do it. So one of the important things for me was a job, even if it was one day a week, a job. So I let staff there know that I'm wanting a job, but I have medical limitations, lots of them. I ended up starting one day a week for three hours at Couching Green Community. And that was a year and a half ago, almost two years ago. And now I've moved to three days a week, almost like I'm getting there bit by bit, bit by bit. And I can't even describe the, it, it's not a job to me. 
Um, it's not even remotely close to a job. Yes, I get paid for it, yeah, blah, 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 blah. But it's not a job. Whereas, you know, you wake up in the morning, ah, I have to go to work, crap. Not me. I love going there. It's too much fun. Everybody, the, there is a, a conflict resolution policy. I had to read it when I started. That's the only time I've ever come across it. Nobody pays any attention to it because there's no conflict. People are open and honest with each other and we talk, we laugh. That kitchen has more giggles than anything, especially when I'm there because, you know, I'm a little klutzy. <laughs> So it sounds to me like your life has really done a change from, you know, before your accident to your accident, after your accident, living outside. And here you are now advocating for other people. You're working, people are connecting with you in your voice. You're a voice for people that aren't heard. Well, I don't have money to build, build um, apartment buildings and houses and stuff like that because that's, housing is the most if anybody really truly cares enough to get people off the street and to give them a chance at a real life, if that's what their motivation is, like Michelle's, housing, funding for housing and not just three months worth, permanent. The, when I lived at the Ramada, every three months it was renewed. The day before it was renewed, all of us packed up all our stuff made sure we had tents and tarps and the whole shamaza, we were ready to leave. Because if we had to, if the, it wasn't renewed, the funding, we had until noon to get out. Or police would be called. That's what we were told. And that kind of fear stops you from doing all kinds of things. You're, we were right back out on the street again. Like, I mean, in regards to emotion-wise. Mm -hmm. We couldn't work on trying to quit drinking, quite trying to get off the drugs, trying to work on our medical issues, trying to work on our mental issues. We couldn't, we didn't have the time. We were too consumed with this, the on the edge. And it saddens me that we are still there with the village. I mean, it's, I don't know how many times Michelle and other members of the committees have gone, almost literally, please, please refund us. like. And that is perfect. I am so glad that you let us know how important it is when you look at the continuum of housing, how important and how emotional it is for people that aren't secure, that don't have that permanent funding. We're going to come back with Lee King, who's going to tell us a little bit more about the funding and the continuum of care. I want to say thank you, and we are very honored for having you, you here for and for telling us your me. story. I appreciate it. Like, it's completely illogical to just leave things the way that they are you know, we're all a part of the same village. And that taking care of the people who have the least um, makes us all stronger. And I'm, I'm gonna be proud of this, proud of what we managed to achieve together. Because it really demonstrates when you pull people together, you can actually solve the biggest problems. Welcome back to our final segment of Time to Talk. Today we're talking about homelessness and we have Lee King here with Vancouver Island Lookout. Welcome. Thank you for, being, for inviting me here. It's a great pleasure to be here in Campbell River. Excellent, so we're talking about homelessness and the continuum of housing. But first of all, I'd like to know what is the Lookout? Lookout Housing and Health Society, we've been around 52 years as a BC um, agency. We operate um, overdose prevention clinics, supportive housing, and as we've been talking about earlier, uh, temporary tiny homes. We also offer outreach services and many other supports to help folks who are at the low end or the low barrier need for housing and healthcare services. So we have a long track record and we're proud of what we do and how we do it, but we couldn't do any of it without community. And so we've been talking a little bit about the Village Project and the continuing t continuum of housing. What is the continuum of housing? Well, if you think of the continuum of housing as an arc, you think of uh, folks who are uh, sleeping rough, unhoused, living on the street. You think about perhaps daytime warming shelters, overnight shelters. And then you think about temporary solutions, the village being one of them, temporary housing. And then 
further along that continuum is a lower end of market rental. Market rental eventually down the other end is market ownership. So the village as a temporary housing solution is very, one very important part of that big arc and it fulfills a really important part to help folks who otherwise would not have a place to live. And when they have a home, their outcomes for themselves and for the community just start to rise as we've heard from Tracy today. That's beautifully put. I know we've heard some of the success stories and some of the steps that it took to get through to this project of the village. I'd like to hear from the both of you and especially Michelle, what are some of the pushbacks that have happened when getting to this project when it comes to community and being in the position that you're in? Oh, it's hard to even know where to start, <laughs> I feel, with this, um, with this question. I think that, I mean, if going back into the pandemic, the pandemic kind of gave us space to try something that previously we weren't able to try for a number of different reasons. And once that began, I, I can share with you, like, some of the people who were very uh, opposed to it that when, when those uh, temporary sites were um, opened up, I remember getting this um, pictures that it snowed and pictures from one of the, ma the mound site of someone who could see see it, you know, from the, the place that they lived in. And just that they said, I was completely opposed to this. I'm so grateful it's snowing and everyone here is housed and they're safe. And, and it actually looks beautiful, like covered in, in, in snow. But her point was that people were housed and taken care of, which was very different than her point would have been six months prior to that. Um, that's one example. and And so, we, we found, and one of the things that I, that I struggle to wrap my head around all the time is that it, it is not, as a society, you know, when, when we see people um, living rough or, or unhoused, the, all of the challenges, I, w I know for sure at my council when I first became mayor, and, and I would say it was around 2016 prior to my time being mayor that this really started to happen, and I think it was the combination of the opioid crisis. Um, and, and, and homelessness in our community. Also, we had some um, infrastructure changes in our community that opened up a lot of areas where people were hidden. Uh, that there was, there was so, so it sort of became more and more obvious in our community, but then also everywhere, right? Mm -hmm. And it sort of all of a sudden seemed like it was, it was everywhere we looked. That that was the number one thing people wanted us to deal with. And I hear that all the time from mayors everywhere. And then on the flip side of that, when you try to implement something like a site like this, um, you, you run into opposition because it's that, yes, I don't want them here, but I don't want them there either. And so you're always kind of locked in that place of, but just, just a minute, like we're trying to make a difference in, in your life too, right? Um, when you're talking about people um, defecating in, in, you know, in your doorways and you having to deal with, with, the, the, with mess and, and staff having to deal with all these things in the morning. If people have a place to be and a place to live and um, you know, functioning facilities to access, then that's going to remove that. And so let's try this and see if it works. And that that is always met, well, there's always a level of opposition to that. And I struggle trying to comprehend that. Um, I've, you know, been told by different um, people that, you know, having outhouses or in the, now at the, the new site, there's actually running water washroom facilities. Um, but the fact that they're shared washrooms, you know, is undignified. Well, how is that undignified to compared to someone not having a washroom at all, not having a place to wash their hands, not having a place to sleep? So I'm constantly sort of surprised by, you know, the, the pushback. And one of the, the things when we did open this site, um, because the pandemic sites, the pod sites were part of the pandemic, there was a, it, there, it's a huge difference. Once we transitioned into this site now, um, the site had to go through a temporary use permit. We'd had a site selected, and, and when I say we, it's that we had a COVID um, joint task force that dealt with all of this, and this was kind of the next step. So now we're moving out of COVID, um, we're moving out of all the funding opportunities, how do we take what we've learned, what we know works, and move it into something that becomes more permanent as a temporary, you know, as, as Lee said, as a first stage from being unhoused into something. And I want to just pause there for one second, because one of the things that I hear all the time 
is that if you take people from from um, the street who've been there for a long time, Tracy spoke about this, and if you just you know put them somewhere without supports, without community, people how that's not a successful way of addressing this, right? There are very few people who would be successful in that. What this site and what the the village site um, has provided and does provide is community. It's a sense of belonging, not just in, in terms of the people that you're living in that community with, but also with the broader community. And so when this temporary use permit application came to the city, as I said earlier, there was a, you know, a stack of letters. There was, there was a lot of pushback. Um, and again, I just want to you know, reiterate the, the, the courage of, of, our, of our staff, of, of, our, of our council, of the commitment to, to recognizing that even through all of this, we know from these experiences we've had that this works and we can strengthen the things that need to be strengthened and work with the community to ensure you know, that, that, that there are, if there's an issue, that it's being addressed. And so there's, Lee, Lee can speak more to so, sort of how some of that functions, but we, we made sure that those things were in place before we uh, you know, moved into this, um, this site. And we had another site selected, but that during the length of time it took for all of this to happen, um, that site was no longer accessible for us. The village site, we, we weren't at, at some point about three weeks before it was supposed to open. We didn't even know if it was going to open. We didn't know if we would have to go down. And after all those years of, you know, working through what Tracy talked about, the three months of funding, the we've got six more months of funding, we've got three more weeks of funding, and, and growing a relationship with people where they, uh, you know, I remember going down there and at one point in time and just being like, people are... Their, their, their stress level and anxiety level had risen so high because they didn't know what was happening in days of whether or not everything was going to be shut down. And we were working so hard in the background trying to get this moving forward and funded through BC Housing and, and um, working with the province and, and having to go there and just say, like, please, w just please trust in us. Ha we're doing everything that we can and we're going we're gonna to fight and advocate for you for this not to happen. For, for us to be able to continue to fund this. And I realized at that point the level of, um, you know, and, and I remember the one, the, the young man I was speaking to, he said, okay, okay, y you know, you're right, this has continued. But to be faced with that all the time and the anxiety, and, you know, as Tracy spoke so well to that and, and what that actually does to people. And what would it do to the community, the broader community too, if all of a sudden, you know, 34 people are back out with nowhere to go? Th that's not a way forward. And, and that when people come on to the site, they're coming on, they're, you know, sometimes there's, there's so many stories of people starting by sleeping outside on the little over, over covered porch that they have because they're not ready to go inside yet. And this is kind of this, uh, this sort of more outdoor kind of community model. Um, everyone has to come out all the time. Staff can see them when they have interactions with each other, with staff, um, community groups, um, uh, uh, sorry, mostly community organizations can come and, you know, meet with them. People, family can come and visit them. So it, it really has provided a sense of community and worth and connection. And so when, when we went through that, you know, those are all the things that were in our minds as we're looking at the stack and listening to people um, oppose this. That what, what is the alternative? The alternative is not worth you know, not seeing what we can do with this and how we can work to improve this and how we can, you know, make this a real model. And, and so, um, so our, our council approved the temporary use permit and ever since then, you know, have been ongoing advocating, working with other people to try to get this added to the provincial um, approved continu continuum of housing is first, this is the first step. You want people off the street? This is a great way to do it. There's a, a large number of people that would work well in this model. You couldn't put 100 people in one place, mm -hmm. then you know probably the magic number is somewhere between 40-ish, 50 per site um, and done in, in different ways. And you have to have things like peer support programs. This has a healthy, robust peer mm -hmm. support gram program that we also always have to fight for to get funded uh, as part of this. You know, It has to be in place because mm -hmm. it, is, it is vital to the health and the success of the, it, the, the, the people themselves and also that connection with the community around them because they go out and you know clean up around the neighborhood they they help work with the neighbors there's so many again success stories of that but the pushback is hard and and it's hard to because you don't know what's going to happen and you know that things aren't always going to be perfect 
we don't live in that magical world where you know you do something and everything is roses and butterflies. Um, there's thorns too, but we work through those things, right? Mm -hmm. um, and we figure them out. And that's one thing I just really congratulate you know the team at Lookout mm -hmm. um, for answering us first when we reached out to you <laughs> uh, during the pandemic to see if you would consider doing this but for how well you have built this path forward with, with working with community, with addressing these things, with, with really creating, continuing to create and grow um, something that's really peer informed and that works with the community. And that's something really quickly I wanna touch on again is, um, just to put it out there bluntly is, folks are probably going, so you're gonna put the site where? That's where my business is. And they've already experienced people defecating in their doorways. They've experienced needles, drug paraphernalia, blood. And let's be honest, people that are owning businesses aren't necessarily aware of what the risks or non-risks are when it comes to dealing with this type of stuff, whether it's defecation, blood, needles, paraphernalia. So you're saying that folks would be having that in their mind and then you built this thing and you had this pushback. Then you had a peer program. Tell me a little bit more about how people came to accept it in the, in the interim knowing that this was a temporary program. Well, I can certainly say that from the outset and um, we were honored to work on this journey with elected officials, appointed officials and neighbors folks can sometimes be concerned about the unknown. Mm -hmm. So our approach at Lookout from the outset was to meet with all the neighbors in a 150 meter radius, meet with all the businesses, meet with all the nonprofits in the Cowichan Valley, talk about their concerns, and talk about how this project would re reduce those kinds of concerns to the point that when we are successful in getting approval for the project, our biggest detractors have become our biggest supporters. And we go beyond that because it's not enough to get a project approved. Yes, we had 34 folks who were previously unhoused who are now contributing to society, who are taking advantage of outreach services, detox, who are looking for uh, gainful employment, who are helping with peer programs but we established a community advisory committee, which at the very beginning met, I think we were every week or two weeks, uh, now we're every month. So we listen to neighbors, we listen to all the other agencies in the valley, whether they're service providers or not, and we talk about opportunities and issues, and we deal with them in real time, so that the success of the village temporary tiny homes is not static. It's very much an organic uh, project that listens to community. And that's why we have the view that this could be an important permanent part of the housing continuum that might really justify from a business case, uh, long-term predictable funding from senior government levels. And I would also say that it's not just enough to say, well, it's a wonderful success story in the Cowichan Valley. How might that work in Port Alberni? How might that work in Campbell River or Kelowna or Prince George? It has to be a local made in community solution. So while we may have the framework, while local municipalities, the city of Duncan may have the framework, it really has to be overlaid with what works best locally. Mm -hmm. So there's no cookie cutter, but the framework is there. And when we work with local community on this journey, and it is a journey because there's ups and downs, mm -hmm. we can formulate a plan and seek funding to get an approval for a site that helps folks have their home, have a roof over their head, uh, but also works best for the community. So one of the things that the village has done is to allay community concerns, not just to help the folks who live there, but to help the neighbors as well, to contribute to clean up programs in the community. So this can be very much a community, a broad based success solution, but it's come a long way and we're still learning, mm -hmm. but we think it's a transferable model to other communities. That's amazing. So aside from looking at the uh, community being a framework for everywhere else, what are some of the things that you believe that this project in particular or transferring it to other communities is needed? What is the biggest supports that can happen for something like this? 
Well, the supports come from a variety uh, of, of, uh, of areas. We've talked about the neighborhood support. We've talked about local, local municipal government support, support from local First Nations, from elected officials, from senior government officials, from funding agencies. All those supports are necessary, but there needs to be a willingness to work together to go from where we were two or three years ago to the success stories we know that we can deliver. So it takes a whole bunch of folks working laterally together towards a common aim, and that's easier said than done. It means lots of meetings, it means lots of difficult conversations, mm -hmm. uh, it can mean listening to potential solutions to add on to what, what worked in Duncan, may, may or may not work elsewhere. But the whole notion of community support is vital because it will produce community-wide benefits. It's not just for the folks who, are, who now have pride of place in their home because they close their front door, they get support services, services are brought in, uh, they can go off-site and get other support services. Um, so the whole notion of support is very much, I guess, embodied in the word village. Mm -hmm. It's a village of supports, and that's why it works. Thank you. And, and one of the things, too, is that to remember that when we're looking at this, you know, if we wanted to address homelessness in our community, on, on Vancouver Island, in the province, in the country, we have to have the will from other levels of government to do this. Municipalities, we, d we don't have funding or resources to do these things. What we do have is voices to be at these tables. COVID gave us an opportunity we've never had to actually push something and, and try something new. And, and, and it's proven that when we can do that, we can do that well when we do come together and work together with that common goal in mind. But this, isn't, this is part of what is needed. This is not the entire picture, but it's a really important part because um, it, it, it provides and can, can provide that first, you know, first transition. And, and then where do we go from here? And what do we need for, you know, what do these 10 people need? What does this one person need? But it allows us at least that, that space to get people from the streets so that we know where they are, so that they, they are you know, able to um, access basic, their basic needs, having th those taken care of. And then we can look at what comes next you know, for you. This isn't a one size, as Lee says, fits all. But it's the start of getting to that place where you know, people can be um, assessed and supported to get to whatever it is that they need next. So there's multiple things that people need. And, and, and they're very different. But the basics comes down to what Tracy said. Mm -hmm. We need to house people so that we can actually get them to that n next stage of support, whatever it is that they need, um, whatever that next step on their journey is. And that's something that we can do um, if we're committed to doing it. And that I, I'm hoping, that we all hope, I believe, that the successes, successes that we have had um, shows other levels of government that, that this is something to believe in and support to completely, we have the opportunity to completely change the trajectory of where we are right now in a very short period of time if there is a willingness to do so. Yeah, and this is about tra changing trajectories for the better. I mean, you heard from Tracy how she considered him herself in society, how she as a citizen was regarded. And you heard the success, the way in which she is regarded now when, when the mayor offered her a cup of coffee and, and how it really progressed from there where she's a contributing member of society. That's so important. When we have folks who are previously unhoused, who are now contributing, when we have a more, um, a better sustainable community, when we have neighbors who take pride in having the village as their neighbor, who will go and talk about it to their friends and colleagues. That's an important part of the success story as well, we believe. Thank you so much. And thank you for giving us a real holistic view of a project that looks at homelessness. Thank you, Tracy. Thank you, Corelli. Thank you very much for coming today. And we hope to learn more and that hopefully this makes some positive changes. And thank you for joining us. See you next time on Time to Talk. Thank you.